move to the policy panel now. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, first two representatives of the South, uh, well, South Af from South Africa. We have uh, Henry Roman from the Department of Science and Technology, who will join us here, and uh, Dr. Inga Jacobs Mata from CSIR, uh, who was instrumental in, in work on, on eco innovation in, in South Africa. And uh, from Sweden, we have Goran Mantlund from Vinova, who is one of the one of the I either say leading figures in, in uh, working on system innovation and in, in Europe and, and, and beyond. So, so your reflections will be very much welcome. I'd like to invite you to, to sit on the table. Um, unfortunately, uh, the representative from the uh, scientific and technological research Ansel in Turkey, Turkey could not come because of the for family reasons. If, uh, while you're sitting, I would like to actually ask Will, uh, the microphone works in front of you, just because I understood that we are going qu quite rushing through this process. There's a lot of things that's, that's kind of behind the scenes that we just don't have time to share. But before we switch, could you, could you say a few words about what we will do with that? What is, what is, the, what, what is our you know, objective? What is your objective to, what would you want to achieve with this exercise? And then we'll switch to the panel. So, th thanks, Michael. So we have, um, we have both more optimistic, aspirational objectives and nearer term, definitely achievable objectives. The definitely achievable objectives are to complete a series of reviews. So we have more in the pipeline, the next, the next of which will be China. Uh, and we have a few other uh, country reviews uh, under, under kind of preliminary development. So we will have a family of, of uh, reviews that will provide three kinds of insights that uh, will be useful, insights into the specific innovation performance of those countries and their innovation policy systems. So there will be direct policy-focused learnings from that. There will be insights into the usefulness of this kind of process for assessing country innovation systems and this kind of evaluative um, uh, score-based approach. And, and there will be uh, insights into the usefulness of the framework uh, and these criteria as a way of assessing policy systems for innovation in the context of sustainability. Um, so we will certainly have those. Um, we hope that those, will be, those insights will, um, will bear further fruit in that um, it will certainly be desirable for us to facilitate further country reviews beyond those within the NO4SD project. Um, but by providing this toolkit, um, we hope that other countries will find it sufficiently useful that they will want to um, conduct such appraisals themselves. Um, and uh, just as importantly, we think it's likely and um, desirable that some of these ideas, both in terms of process and in terms of framework, get adopted by uh, organizations like UNCTAD, like the OECD, in terms of informing how they frame their review processes for uh, innovation for in the context, innovation reviews and assessment in the context of sustainability challenges. Thank you, Will. I mean, I hope this, this also sets uh, the context for, for our panel. And first, I would like to ask you, what are, what are your impressions from the presentations? What, what did you find of use? What's clear? What you could readily use in, in, in your well, day to day day work? Um, and how does it compare to the current practices in policy evaluation, policy reflection? And I would like to start, um, if you allow me, with our hosts uh, first. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just to maybe start us off, um, I suppose I was uh, co-opted onto this panel because of the, the work that I did um, uh, almost, it's about seven or eight years ago for the OECD. Um, I reviewed the eco-innovation policies for South Africa back then. And um, just listening to the presentations now, I found them very interesting because um, in our national landscape, I think a lot has changed since 20, 2010, 2011, which is when we did the, the review. Um, but also a lot has, has stayed the same. We still have the, uh, many of the same challenges. So it would be interesting to see how they get addressed and analyzed in this, in this uh, uh, process. But also what I like about this process is that Unlike the OECD reviews, um, where we didn't have a clear breakdown of criteria, 
it seems like that that's uh, one of the strengths of this process. I would have actually liked to have seen um, a real breakdown of each of the criteria. So how are you measuring each of them? You know, uh, what is your your scoring system? Uh, because I think that's that's the the devil can be in that uh, that detail there. Um, I had a few other points, but um, maybe maybe I'll we'll come back to that and I'll hand it over to the colleagues. Thank you, Henry. Um, I won't repeat, but for me, what was interesting is um, the similarity between the different countries in some respects. Um, I'll take Turkey as one in South Africa where implementation is a problem. You can come up with really interesting policy and good, good policy on paper, but when you're trying to implement it, you, it falls down. And then with Sweden, that value of death problem is something we, we've been grappling with for probably a decade or more as well. And the TIA that, that, that was mentioned, the Technology Innovation Agency, was set up to try and bridge that, that valley. Uh, we've not succeeded. Um, it's a, it's, it, that, I think, is really hard to do. Um, everybody is w um, trying to figure it out, and you've got endless papers on, on why it doesn't work. But also, what was interesting to me are the areas that Sweden have identified, smart cities, circular bio-based economy, those things, those areas, we've identified them as well as areas of interest in our going forward now as we're revising the science and technology white paper for South Africa, another, uh, which hasn't been updated since 1996. Mm. So it's been 20 years. Um, and, that, and these are the areas, the fourth in industrial revolution, as a country, we're looking at it as well. I'll come back to I'll, I'll come back to it later. Thank you very much, Goran. You were in a way called <laughs> to to respond. Yeah. Uh, I first of all, I'm a policymaker mainly, uh, deputy director general of, of the Swedish Innovation Agency. So we are really in the midst of, of things here. I was also interviewed by Verit. I don't know which spider I was in the diagram, but one of them <laughs> it was. Uh, I have also been involved in driving an, in the high-level policy forum in the Swedish context, driving the sort of the agenda uh, thinking together with, uh, with, the, with the ministry and other agencies, and pushing strongly for the SDG targets as a main, main, uh, main sort of arena for, for policy across the board in the Swedish context, which is much easier to say and put on, 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 on the wall than, than just to implement, which, which is really the challenge. But uh, a main, uh, I think, uh, additionality of this is that um, evaluators, evalua uh, evaluation frameworks in the OECD, in the EU, uh, or nationally, uh, but among consultants, do not have this framework. It doesn't ad ad address uh, so, so sort of systemic uh, transition things, SDG targets, the, all those things that are in this framework, which is a real problem for policymaking. Because how you get evaluated is extremely important and sensitive thing for policy making. So if you don't evaluate or try to understand those things, then policymakers get evaluated uh, for the wrong, on the wrong parameters, which they do. Uh, so, but this is much more difficult. So, uh, and I've been involved and instrumental in getting an OECD review two times, 2012 and 2016 in Sweden, and the last time we actually ordered them, asked them, which is not the normal thing, to do it differently. And they did. Well, we paid them, but they did. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, because uh, we, we, we thought we have to understand the gravitation. The gravitation is a word that is not, may, maybe not perfect, but of the system. Uh, so, so where the governance issues came in. And the governance issues are not something that they really look into uh, automatically. Uh, and uh, what is the root of things? Why the system or parts of the system, like the higher education system, doesn't provide the dynamics that it, sh it should? But I think that was despite the lack of a framework like this. So, if you succeed, I, I, we uh, would very much push and uh, support every effort in this uh, regard towards and in, in relation to the OECD and the EU, I, I think that's it's extremely important. So that was the most impressive thing overall uh, in this. And then I have details, of course, uh, in this. But that's, that's the first yeah. thing. Thank you very much, Karen. I, the, the, I, I also, I mean, I do believe that uh, uh, we cannot emphasize 
the, the role of evaluation system, monitoring system in policy formation enough. I mean, this is one of this invisible often part of policy making that, that, that is often restricted to rather small group of people, you know, specialized in evaluation, often working in the kind of in the shadow of, 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 of uh, more catchy political mm -hmm. debates, yet the, the evidence base that uh, this group provides is critical when, when it comes to making real choices between different alternatives. And, um, and I wanted to ask you if you, um, currently, when, you, when you're facing making choices and prioritizing issues, you know, there's so many challenges that various country, countries face. Uh, do these frameworks like this and similar initiatives that, that are ongoing help in prioritizing issues? When it, when, uh, which, which are not, which cannot be just you know, based on science, but also on, on some sort of debate with stakeholders that are, you know, that, that were contested issues, the contested uh, issues are, are, are mentioned. What sort of framework, and if this framework could be helpful in, in supporting prioritization? Okay, I, I, think, um, I think they definitely do help in prioritizing uh, key issues. Um, the, the one area that I, I think might be a challenge is that it might also uh, sort of brush under the carpet some other issues, you know. So uh, j just thinking about this, so for, so for example, I mean, Ellen raised the issue around um, gender centrality. And for me, that criteria is perhaps the most, it's, it's the fuzziest, if I can put it that way. Um, in the sense that uh, he also mentioned and Henry mentioned, you know, in South Africa, we have no shortage of eco-innovation policies, even though they're not called eco-innovation policies. We've got, uh, you know, at the national level, at the sectoral level, um, our challenge is, of course, uh, you know, coherence between them and coordination. Um, and so is that an agenda centrality issue? Or is it a behavioral issue by our policymakers? You know, so so for me the, the thing is how are we dealing with the soft softer, I don't know if that's the right word, softer issues of, of policy making. Um, I, I feel in South Africa, um, you know, I'll I'll sorry Andy, I'm gonna just put you in the limelight a bit, but when we did the, the eco uh, innovation policy review in, in 2010, 2011, um, Henry had just started working at the uh, Department of Science and Technology. We didn't have a roadmap for water. We didn't have a, a roadmap for waste. And um, he was literally one man and, a, and an office. And uh, slowly with time, um, you know, he's gotten one additional resource. Uh, but, but just that, you know, the role of an individual in, 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 in a gender setting um, has been for me, quite key, because we wouldn't have, or maybe we would have, I don't know, but you know, we've had it because of Henry driving the, the roadmap process in South Africa for, for water and waste. And so, yeah, so, so when I talk about soft issues that you know, are sort of underlying but equally important is the role of champions in the policy-making system, um, the role of uh, you know, innovators in, in policy-making as well. Does it resonate? It does. Um, I think uh, direct prioritization maybe not, but uh, facilitating the, the possibility of actually seeing the whole picture, uh, looking across the different silos, even uh, vertically, I think was mentioned uh, before, uh, to uh, sort of the local level and the national level, understanding if possible, and that's, uh, that's the challenge of this kind of evaluation, understanding where different policies, different structural issues, institutional stuff, uh, would uh, block each other, which you don't see usually when you work in your own silo. You don't. You have uh, all the rational things uh, uh, calling for different kinds of policies when you look into a silo, which look quite differently when, when if you could understand the, sort of the systemic things, which you don't, because every lens is uh, silo-based. Uh, so that's why these different kinds of uh, evaluations, on, not only evaluations, but also uh, sort of analysis, uh, would be ne necessary, in fact. Uh, from there, you could find new priority, uh, priorities. 
new uh, sort of um, focal points yeah. for priorities, which you don't see otherwise. Uh, which uh, is also why I say that uh, putting the, sort of the SDG targets on the wall, which we have done in Sweden, and then we have sort of uh, analyzed things uh, 1 to, through 17. Now the difficult things come uh, when uh, you really would like to drive sort of systemic change, which re requires you find nexuses or uh, you uh, relieve uh, sort of tensions between uh, trade or make trade offs maybe uh, between certain, thing uh, certain things. So then you, uh, conflict, you come into conflict uh, between different uh, targets, agencies, uh, policies, ministries, and those things, those are much more difficult. You have to re reinvent uh, the sort of the ministerial uh, procedures, um, and there are big obstacles for this, at least uh, in where, from where I sit. Thank you very much. So, you know, that, that's, that's one of this, this conversational tool in a way, so it also helps us not to shy away from dealing with issues that are conflicting. And, uh, in, uh, okay, do differ from culture to culture. I don't think there's a culture that likes conflict, but it's easier to bring this issue to the agenda in some settings than in other. But potentially a tool like this could help it. And, and by the way, the audience was not forgotten, so <laughs> that's why I'm sort of moving towards looking at you. We have 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes as we started later. Let's see how long we can endure and, and how long we'll be able to, 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 to continue before the other group comes. Well, the question is, are there any questions to, to the panel and the presenters? I see Rene. It works if you press the button. Well, I don't have to be first, but... Um, you, you are the only one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been part of the process, so I also helped to develop this, uh, this approach and, um, and sort of... Um, um, it, it, apart from the, the criteria, and the criteria are being approached in two ways. I mean, there's the scoring element, and there's this, this trend uh, uh, as, as a kind of quantitative element, but uh, there's also, you know, qualitative descriptions of what kind of policy exists and, you know, what kind of stakeholders in society are behind certain uh, types of innovation uh, and which ones are resisting. Uh, so all of that, I think, is part of the, uh, of the appraisal. Um, and um, if I compare it to the traditional approach that's used in the Netherlands, which is the country that I live in, uh, we have uh, an advisory council who uh, produces reports on innovation policy every, well, two years or something like that. And uh, they're knowledgeable people, and they come up with usually with, well, you know, you, you know uh, in, insightful uh, uh, reports. But what's missing in the report is, 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 is very much the evidence base. So it's the opinion of experts yeah, about sort of backing challenges or backing winners, you know, which, which get articulated. So if I could compare it with those forms of intelligence, but because what it's really about is, is a policy intelligence system, I think this adds something. But I, I'd, well, I'd love to hear your views on that because I think you also, no, I mean, it also forces the experts really to, to discuss with one another and policy makers who also are, well, they're experts, but also, you know, they have to make choices, are part of a process uh, which I think is useful uh, because they, well, they, well, they, they, uh, they, well, they discuss with one another what's missing in the existing policy frameworks and, and possible ways for improving that. So, well, my question is if you compare it with, let's say, the, uh, let's say the, uh, the, the reports from committees, does this add something or, well, can we do without it? Back to the panel, and uh, we're still waiting for more questions. If not, the panel will ask questions to the audience. <laughs> There's always an alternative. <laughs> um, in my view, I think it does add something. Um, it, if, if I looked at it correctly, and like Inga said, we can't see the detail, but it brings a, an, a, a bit of an a, a objective view. I think that's very important when you bring this type of information to a policymaker that it be an objective view. Um, we also have a, na a national um, council for innovation that also helps us with innovation policies. Um, and we do consensus type studies as well when we analyze certain things at, at the same time. But I think having criteria the way you've mapped it out adds to that 
evidence base that we can then, in, I wouldn't say it makes uh, or makes us make the decision concretely, but it, what it does do, it informs the debate. Mm. Um, and, and that's important because there, there, there are many factors that determine why I would do a certain thing. And some of them are social, some of them are political, and some of them may be technical. So I have to con you have to consider all these things at once. So having objective criteria presented before you with that evidence base does help the debate, definitely. And, and, and the silos in government, it, it also helps you bridge those silos between ministries in particular, because you're going with objective evidence, mm. not opinions, which is also key when you're engaging, a, for instance, myself in science and technology, I have to engage with trade and industry. Trade and industry is not really interested in what's happening in the R&D space. And they're interested in how many factories are you going to build and how, how, how many jobs are you going to create. Mm. And if I can't tell them that, they're not interested. They don't, they don't even op open the door for the discussion. So having objective views to send before I get there is also very useful. Mm. Thank you. Go on. Push this. OK. Right. Uh, I would like uh, more to compare uh, this or relate it to the OECD uh, kind of endeavors. Um, because I think uh, one thing that I think is a virtue of those is that, you know, they really invest time in it. Uh, a year, it would take a year, uh, with some five, six, uh, seven experienced experts, uh, experienced which also have a, sort of a framework which they have worked on. Uh, so they can compare without uh, knowing the details with other countries. So the benchmark is sort of internalized in a way. Uh, they can uh, use both uh, indicators or, or quantitative facts or qualitative facts to uh, sort of confront policymakers with. And then I think uh, a key thing that happens in those surveys or uh, reviews is what um, Ipek uh, mentioned from Turkey. You know, you have those interactions. Uh, which is uh, a scene which we also have experienced, which are, is very, very important. But, uh, so that's, that's a, th a thing which I think is important, but they don't have the framework. This framework is another framework. Uh, so what I see is uh, scoring here, I think, um, may be important uh, element of the process, but not an outcome. Yeah. Because I think the scoring is dangerous in a way. If you think it's a score, you can score. And then by the scoring, you can understand the differences or the, uh, between countries or even yourself. Um, but if you add to it uh, this intelligence that you can have with, if, you, if you invest a year uh, in it, uh, is in, uh, extremely valuable. So then I think this framework is, is very good. Um, but I think you know, it's a process, much more uh, than just a new scoring set of scores. So, thank you. And we'll have at least one more voice from the floor. Anya. Yes, uh, thank you. It, it was really interesting. I, I found also the, the whole framework really interesting, addressing issues that are maybe not always addressed when talking about uh, eco innovation policies. To be honest, I was a little bit surprised with. Uh, how high some of the scores were. It, it kind of makes it look as if, you know, we're done with, uh, with eco innovation. And, and it also made me think, you know, how can we best use this process? Because the diagnosis is, okay, is important, but it's probably still the easiest uh, part. The, the interesting part, I, I think, is when you try to do something to improve um, on those and then check and see if it worked or not. So, so I was wondering also uh, with your policy making perspective, you know, how, how can you think this tool can realistically work as something more than a diagnosis, but as a framework in which you, you are also looking at the effectiveness of the activities that, that you're taking also together with other stakeholders. And this links to, to the last uh, of my comments. I was thinking, I know that some of these processes are still ongoing, but I was wondering what is the plan of giving it back to stakeholders? What are they supposed to do with it? Is it something that you're also going to, I don't know, um, sent to the media, or is it supposed to be more an internal document? I am curious, what's the plan? 
Thank you, Anya. And you, as, as we are really running out of time, but I think we, we, we can still take five to ten minutes. I don't see any objections. Um, the question that Anya asked, the first one, was, is, a, is, I think, a good question to ask, to, to, to finish with, which means, am I confused? Or are we finishing at five, right? I'm looking at you. Yeah, okay. you. You gave me a very scary look, Astrid. That's why I'm... <laughs> ah, okay. No. <laughs> So you just like this. <laughs> so, so the question, the question is indeed from your perspective. It's, if we could ask your advice, uh, where should we take it uh, now? I mean, it, it's part of the project, right? I mean, we took an, I mean, we we took an initiative, uh, uh, UCL hat on. We took we took an initiative uh, within the project to develop this because we sense there is a need for something. But, but uh, it was a bit of a, it, we took a bit of a risk as well, because we didn't, you know, it was, it's not like a typical evaluation process when you have a client and TOR and you're really responding to the needs. We, we moved a little bit ahead. But if you gave us, would, if you were to give us an advice, which direction to push it and how to present it to, well, yourselves and your colleagues in other countries, what, what would you say? That's my, that, that, that would be my question. Um, and, uh, uh, bef and after that, I'll say, uh, or maybe Will, I'll ask Will to, to, to say a few words on how concretely, what are the next steps in the process? How to make best use of this? <laughs> okay, um, I can start us off. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point, and I was also thinking about it, and without, um, you know, having examined the, the methodology in, in detail, I would say that the, the value add of this is in a regular or an annual um, M&E process, so a monitoring and evaluation of, of policies, which we don't currently do in South Africa. You know, we, I, I always joke, you know, we, we're very good policy makers, but we're not very good evaluators and assessors of our policies. So sort of to have that kind of a regular time series of the effectiveness of, of mm -hmm. eco-innovation policies. Um, one, and, and this is almost like turning the question again, maybe to the to the authors and to those involved in it, is um, linked to that. Uh, Henry and I were sitting at the back and he sort of whispered and he joked with me. He said, oh, this is great because, um, you know, I'm going to get the waste roadmap evaluated without even having asked for it. <laughs> and, um, you, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, it's an interesting point because... Um, that is also a, a, another aspect, you know, the, the m and &E of our programs and, um, you know, whether it's a, a tax incentive program, whether it's a subsidy program, whether it's a fund, um, are they achieving their eco-innovation objectives, you know, and how do they contribute? So um, I would be interested in finding out how does a, a framework like this, which is a national framework, Mm -hmm. How can it be scaled almost down locally to a project or a program level um, to, to, to get that kind of interrogation, um, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I actually like what Inga's just said as well, because what we do at DST is if we have a program like the Global Change Program, uh, last year we ran the midterm review of that program. It's a 10-year program. So... At f most of our programs are 10 years. So at the five-year mark is where we do a, an, an in, a, a review of the program. And there we actually now, since the inception of the Department of um, Planning and Monitoring and Evaluation um, that reports to the presidency, we work with them to evaluate our programs. So, so they come on board to help us to, make, to get that objective view. But I think this tool could also assist, like Inga saying, if you can bring it down to like the waste roadmap thing. The water roadmap's been in play for a year now as well, just so you know. PwC, interestingly enough, a year and a half ago, did a review of is the, road, the waste roadmap something that business can utilize? Unfortunately, they never shared the document with me, so I don't know what the outcome was. <laughs> they did interview myself and Linda, but we don't know what came of that. So I'm, they were look, looking at it purely from an, uh, an investor and a business perspective, which would, would have been a really interesting view to obtain. Um, but yeah, I think if we can do it like that and, and have a, an additional tool like this, it does help us to, because things change. I mean, in five years in the, in the, in the eco-innovation space, things have changed markedly. 
uh, besides the big policy things like Trump withdrawing himself from climate change and things like that, there are other changes, technological changes that have come to the fore. And we need to adjust what we are doing because a 10-year plan is very long-term in that respect. Thank you. Goran. Uh, I think, first of all, I think that the, the question from Anya was, it? Anya. Uh, was uh, extremely important and I forgot that point before. Uh, you, you know, you really have to uh, distinguish between uh, levels, performance, mm -hmm. and directions, ambitions uh, of policy making. And I think uh, some of these responses may have uh, sort of suffered from such ambiguity in a way. Uh, we, are we talking about directions, ambitions, or are we actually talking about the level of, uh, of uh, performance of, of, of a country in those dimensions? I think that is very important. So uh, whether or not it's effective or really generating uh, results uh, is a key thing. Uh, how, what to do with it? Uh, I think um, we have a tipsy consortium, which is one thing, uh, together with South Africa and uh, Maybe you could Colombia. explain in a few words, because I'm not sure if everyone okay. in the room knows. Well, what By the way, let's do exercise. Who knows what TIPC, uh, aka TIPC, is? It's hand, Transition Innovation Policy Consortia, which okay. was a pilot project uh, of, from this, uh, for this year, uh, led by Spru uh, and, and uh, Sussex. Uh, Yuan Schott, you, 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 I, I'm sure you know him. Uh, and um, six countries, uh, sort of, uh, at least five, uh, were uh, uh, sort of active during this first pilot phase. South Africa was one, Colombia another one, Sweden, no Norway and Finland. Okay, and others are now invited to, uh, to come on board. Uh, one thing uh, related to that, is that for us, uh, we would push and engage most heavily in the next round, which is uh, looking five years ahead, is evaluation. How do you get an evaluation uh, framework? How do you get an evaluation practice uh, in relation to system innovation policy or system transition policy? Because we lack it. And if we lack it, we won't get any system transition policy because policymakers would not be able to, to deal with such things if they don't get uh, sort of supported uh, or supported in a way by uh, evaluations uh, looking at that. Uh, so we don't have that. Uh, we are also investing quite heavily in, in research. Another track would be, but I think it would be a little bit uh, more, uh, more um, obstacles around it. It's uh, how to get it into uh, the OECD uh, evaluations. Okay. Uh, but that's something that we would push. Uh, I would, uh, as a delegate in the TIP, uh, now TIP again, but this is uh, in, in the OECD. Uh, so we have a meeting next uh, in, in, in the early December, P pushing hard for um, uh, TIP uh, uh, helping the countries around the table, which are all here, uh, on mutual learning around system uh, innovation policies, and which means that o the OECD would need to refine or change also uh, the way they, they sort of approach both analysis indicators and evaluation around this. But, you know, uh, some structures uh, would be, take longer to, to, to change, but uh, good ideas, I, I think, are the only way. Thank you very much. So, so you see, I mean, it, we, we, see, we are in the process of, or moment, or phase of change. It's not only that, that uh, the, the world is changing, uh, the policies are changing, but also analytical frameworks have to catch up, and pretty quickly. Because we, we need data, you know, between getting right evidence and then designing policy and then seeing effects. We're talking about years, if not decades. So, so this is actually quite urgent. Um, Will, I, I, I uh, called, you, called on you before. So, so what are the next steps in the project? When can we expect something available in the public space? Uh, okay, so the next steps, I mean, there's, there's a, f a few ways of, of framing this. In terms of the uh, reports, there will be country reports for Turkey and the UK pretty soon, and we saw the timelines for uh, the Swedish and South African reports uh, earlier. So there, there are those pilots. Um, the next country will be starting in January, and that's China. Um, and we have a few other countries that we're still kind of negotiating exactly which countries um, will go forward and in what form. Um, so we, we will continue with the country uh, reviews. And um, in terms of how, that, you know, how, how those are disseminated and used, uh, country teams are best placed to be able to understand how, how best to use those within any particular country. So yes, of course, there'll be published reports. Um, we might even produce an academic paper at some point. Um, who knows? Uh, in fact, we probably will, being <laughs> academics. Um, but so there'll be, there'll be publications. 
Um, uh, there will be engagement through the country teams, and then we have a, a kind of a whole parallel set of engagements with these other kinds of um, policy institutions like the OECD, like UNCTAD, uh, like UNDP, um, who, many of whom also have uh, policy review processes of some kind, and so uh, engaging with those to um, provide the insights from our process, some of which they may, fi may find very relevant and useful, others of which they may not find so useful, but the idea is that we can inform some of those ongoing um, policy assessment uh, and policy appraisal mechanisms that, that already exist. Thank you, Will. Um, I'm looking at time. I think we could easily continue for another hour, but uh, we need to respect the agenda and respect ourselves and the time, also a limited resource. Um, so, well, thank you very much. It's, it's really okay to, to, to finish the session with questions, actually, because we are we're sharing an, uh, insights on an ongoing process. So we are very grateful for your inputs, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, we will definitely take them on board. They are very precious to us. So we will also, you can count on, on us getting back in touch with you uh, at some point, uh, as uh, obviously everything that we do within InnoforSD will be publicly available. So, so that's, that goes without asking. And uh, just one minute, uh, wearing my UNCTAG hat. Uh, it is relevant also for the UN system. So I, I, can, I can share with you uh, um, some news from UNCTAD. UNCTAD is one of the UN agencies that also conducts reviews, focusing mainly on developing countries. And they started the, the, this process in the, in the late 80s. Um, uh, 90s. They, they, uh, the, the approach they took on was firmly based on a um, nation, national system of innovation framework. And uh, with the arrival of the, of the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, uh, there was a realization that this framework needs to be adjusted. Because, because even if national system of innovation remains a useful framework and will be definitely part of any future review around innovation, it does not answer all the questions that we, we heard today. So, so there is an ongoing process and reflection on how to do it in a feasible way. Because you know, there is also, uh, there is a very, th this is a practical challenge. Uh, OECD, UNCTAD, UNESCO, whoever does the reviews, need countries to come to them, to request them and agree to the, to the shape of the review that will be produced. So it's never, it's never one, one agent taking a, an action being innovative, it, it, you need at least two. So you, you need, uh, as you mentioned, Henry's role uh, and, and you, you, your role, both of you in this context. Goran uh, will, be, will be actively working on the agenda in the OECD context. That, that's how it works. It's really about individuals. So it's absolutely important that people like yourselves, policymakers, academics and others, uh, engage with, uh, with agencies that do these reviews because, because this gives them legitimacy and convinces them that actually these frameworks are robust enough because they have doubts. You know, they've been working with the similar frameworks for many, many years is what, what Franz also mentioned, right? I mean, this literature and economic development and so on, it dates back decades. And it's not easy to catch up with all the fresh thinking. So, so actually, events like this are absolutely necessary to move forward this agenda. And, and so with this, I'd like to thank you again very much for your time and thank the audience. I hope it was a useful session. And, uh, well, academic quarter almost. So thank you very much. Thank you.